Well, welcome to church. You know, when we meet together, either in person or online, we meet together not just to remember things that happened 2,000 years ago or letters that were written 2,000 years ago, but to celebrate, to celebrate the death and resurrection and ascension of Jesus Christ. We're celebrating that there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Because through Jesus Christ, the law of the Spirit has set us free from the law of sin and death. So we're celebrating not just the death and resurrection and ascension of Christ, but what the Spirit is doing in you today and what the Spirit will do through you in the future. So as we sing together, let's lift up our hearts and minds and celebrate this God that loves us, that cares for us and sustains us.
Holy Spirit, move in power. Ignite my heart with your holy fire. Show me the Father, show me the Son. Revive my soul again, O Spirit, come. Welcome to church. Well, it's another week, another Sunday, another church online. And I don't know how you're feeling. I don't know what you're expecting from the next hour or so. Maybe your expectations are a bit so-so. Done this before, another week. But can I say, 
Whenever God opened His Word, expect radical things to happen. In the next hour or so, as we pray and read God's Word and we listen to Him, He is going to do amazing things, small and big, ways we expect and ways we don't. So are you expecting God to work in you as we gather together in church online? We've been looking at the power of the Holy Spirit. And over the last couple of weeks, we have seen that God, the Holy Spirit, through faith in Jesus Christ, dwells in us. And as we're going to see today, has given us each a gift, at least one, a gift that comes from the Holy Spirit to bless and build up others, build up the church. As we look at this important reality, whether you know your gifts or not, whether you're using them or not, we're going to see what gifts God, the Holy Spirit, has given us and how we can use them, how God intended us to use them for His glory and one another's good. Well, we have much to thank God for, so we're going to join together in a prayer of thanksgiving. Please join with me. Gracious God, our Heavenly Father, we humbly thank You for all Your gifts so freely given for life and health and safety, for work and rest and friendship, and for the wonder of creation. We thank you for preserving throughout history a people for yourself. Above all, we praise you for our Saviour Jesus Christ, for his death and resurrection, for your life-giving spirit and the hope of sharing in your glory. Fill our hearts with all joy and peace in believing. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Hi, my name's Beck. Will you continue with me um, in a time of prayer? I want to read from Philippians 4, verses 6 and 7. Don't worry about anything, but in everything, through prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses every thought, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Father, with your word in our hearts and minds, we're so thankful that we can bring our prayers and requests to you, Father. And even when we cannot pray, your Holy Spirit intercedes for us. Build us up with that word this morning, Lord. Father, we lift our world to you, acutely aware of the suffering of many, displaced by war, starving, and facing huge challenges in the face of COVID-19. Lord, in your great love and mercy, please heal the sick, bind up the brokenhearted. Father, may the leaders in our world lead with justice and mercy. Lord, we acknowledge you are in control, working out your plan of salvation. And we ask that we would see a revival of hearts turning to you, that it would sweep the earth more contagious than any pandemic. Closer to home, we lift our nation to you for healing and reconciliation with our First Nations people and for our leaders that they would lead with wisdom and integrity and this morning we want to lift Daniel Andrews to you and ask that you would be with him and his team giving them all that they need in um, energy and wisdom and love and care and peace as they lead Victoria through this very difficult time and indeed father we lift all Victorians to you and ask that um, their hearts would be turned to you Lord as the great healer and for our church Lord we are so thankful for Paul and our pastors and leaders our wardens and our parish council we praise you for them and their tireless work using their gifts to love and to serve us may they know your strength and great joy as they serve father thank you for our current series looking at the holy spirit what a precious gift to us all sealing us for the day of redemption our advocate and our counselor as we look at the gifts of the spirit today Lord, open our eyes to the gifts you've given us 
so that we can use them, our unique gifts, to strengthen and serve the body of Christ. Give us eyes also to see the gifts in others and words to encourage them to use them for your glory. We lift these prayers to you in Jesus' precious name, knowing that you hear us, Lord. Thank you. Amen. Hey everyone, Betsy here. We are continuing our series on the power of the Holy Spirit and who the Holy Spirit is and what the Holy Spirit does. Now today we're going to be in 1 Corinthians and we're going to be looking about the gifts that the Holy Spirit gives us and how we all have to work together with those gifts. Now, 1 Corinthians 12 verses 4 and 5 says, There are different kinds of gifts, but the same Spirit distributes them. There are different kinds of service, but the same Lord. And then on to 6 says, There are different kinds of working, but in all of them and in everyone, it is the same God at work. And so we are going to be seeing how the Holy Spirit empowers us with those gifts to serve the church. And you know what? The church is not fully alive and fully moving when we are not all using our gifts together. We need everyone to be a part of that. And so this reminds me of a story about two brothers. Now, these two brothers lived together in a house on the hill and one brother couldn't see and the other brother had no arms. And their life was made better because they worked together. Every morning, the brother with no arms would tell the brother who couldn't see when his eggs were done. And every morning, the brother who couldn't see would button up the shirt of the brother with no arms. The brother who had no arms would then take the brother who couldn't see everywhere he wanted to go. And the brother who couldn't see would carry the lunch for the brother with no arms. The brother with no arms would warn the brother who couldn't see when danger was near. And the brother who couldn't see would feed the brother who had no arms his lunch every day. If they lived separately, their life would have been harder. But together, there was nothing that these brothers couldn't do. And so sometimes we think we have to do everything ourselves. But that's just not true. We need each other because that's the way that God has made us. He gives each of us special gifts to help each other. But the gifts he gives each of us are not the same. And so in today's service, in the sermon, we're gonna hear more from Paul about all of these different gifts. In kids, in kids' church, we're gonna do the same. So parents, this is the time to get your kids ready for kids' church. And um, there's a minute countdown. And everyone else, grab your coffee, grab, um, your Bible, um, grab some tea, and um, it'll be time for the service. So let's pray, and then we'll have that countdown. Lord, thank you so much that we are empowered by the Holy Spirit and given different gifts to serve the church and to serve you. See you in Kids Church. We all have questions for God, from the everyday questions like, God, what on earth are you doing in the year 2020? To the painfully personal questions like, God, how could you let my sister die? To the sublime and ridiculous questions like, could God heat up a burrito so hot that not even he could eat it? We all have questions for God, and that's why every year we run our One Question for God series. 
This is a chance for us as a church community to engage with the people in our lives and find out what are the issues, questions and barriers that stand between them and a relationship with God. Starting on the first Sunday of September, we're going to launch our 2020 One Question for God series. Over the four Sundays of September, we will answer our community's top and most relevant questions. We'll also seek to answer every category of questions uh, by providing short and shareable answers through our website, social media, uh, community notice boards and other shareable formats. But to find out our community's questions, that's where we really need you. In the past, we've relied on our church's central locations and a few lead up events to gather questions. But this year, we need you more than ever. We're asking you to find out the people in your lives top five questions for God. We're under no false impressions that a lot of the moments in which we used to connect with the people in our lives have gone. We've lost those incidental conversations at the photocopier or catching up at the school gate or cafe connections. Whilst they've gone, the relationships that we have haven't. Every, every week we ask you to be praying for five people in your life. We're asking you to trust that God has heard your prayers and will answer them as you reach out to those five people and find out their one question for God. There are 1,000 adults and children who consider themselves part of our church. And so that's potentially 5,000 questions we could find out. So we're going to ask you to be brave over the next three weeks and find out your friends one question for God. On our website, you'll find uh, answers to the most common questions previously asked in previous years, talks and even invites that you can send on to friends to submit a question or even come along to church and find out an answer. So we're asking you in September of 2020 to be brave, to be bold, to trust God, to love the people in your lives and find out what is their one question for God. Brothers and sisters, grab your Bibles and turn to 1 Corinthians 12 as we explore the spiritual gifts given by the Holy Spirit. Hey church, I'm Jen and this is Dave. And the first reading today comes from 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 1 to 11. If you'd like to just grab your Bibles and join in to read along with me. Now about spiritual gifts, brothers, I do not want you to be ignorant. You know that when you were pagans, somehow or other you were influenced and led astray to mute idols. Therefore, I tell you that no one who is speaking by the Spirit of God says, Jesus be cursed. And no one can say, Jesus is Lord, except by the Holy Spirit. There are different kinds of gifts, but the same Spirit. There are different kinds of service, but the same Lord. There are different kinds of working, but the same God works all of them in all men. Now to each one, the manifestation of the Spirit is given for the common good. To one, there is given through the Spirit the message of wisdom. To another, the message of knowledge by means of the same Spirit. To another, faith by the same Spirit. To another, gifts of healing by that one Spirit. To another, miraculous powers. To another, prophecy. To another, distinguishing between Spirits to another speaking in different kinds of tongues, and to still another the interpretation of tongues. All these are the work of one and the same Spirit, and he gives them to each one just as he determines. Hey church, the second reading is 1 Corinthians chapter 14, starting at verse 26. What shall we say then, brothers? When you come together, everyone has a hymn or a word of instruction, a revelation, a tongue or an interpretation. All of these must be done for the strengthening of the church. If anyone speaks in a tongue, two or at most three should speak, one at a time, and someone must interpret. If there is no interpreter, the speaker should keep quiet in the church and speak to himself and God. Two or three prophets should speak and the others should weigh carefully what is said. And if a revelation comes to someone who is sitting down, the first speaker should stop. For you can all prophesy in turn, so that everyone 
may be instructed and encouraged. The spirits of prophets are subject to the control of prophets. For God is not a God of disorder, but of peace. As in all the congregations of the saints, women should remain silent in the churches. They are not allowed to speak, but must be in submission, as the law says. If they want to inquire about something, they should ask their own husbands at home, for it is disgraceful for a woman to speak in the church. Did the word of God originate with you? Or are you the only people it has reached? If anybody thinks he is a prophet or spiritually gifted, let him acknowledge that what I am writing to you is the Lord's command. If he ignores this, he himself will be ignored. Therefore, my brothers, be eager to prophesy and do not forbid speaking in tongues, but everything should be done in a fitting and orderly way. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. It's Christmas morning and it's time for the gifts. And Johnny and Jackie are so excited. Uh, Johnny goes first, he gets a Nintendo Switch and he is blown away. Thanks, Dad, you're the best. Jackie gets five gifts. She gets a a watch, a game, a craft, a a Smiggle voucher, a Guinness Book of Records. She's saying, wow, I didn't deserve all this. Thanks, Dad. And Jackie and Johnny, they love to share their gifts. Jackie's playing in the Nintendo and John is doing the craft and they're loving each other. And it's this beautiful picture of Christmas Day of grateful children sharing their gifts to bless each other. Isn't that a wonderful picture? Joy, gratitude, sharing. Of course, in reality, Christmas Day is often not like that. It's often fighting and squabbling and moaning and comparing. And Jack is saying, I'd like a Nintendo Switch. That costs more than my gifts. And John is saying, you got five gifts, I got one gift. And Jack is saying, Dad loves me more because he gave me five gifts, you got one. It's terrible. No joy, no gratitude, no other person-centeredness. Well, friends, in his kindness, the, the Spirit of God has given gifts to us, undeserved gifts. Every believer is given these gifts. And imagine a church that's full of gratitude for the gifts you've been given, full of joy as you use your gift to serve other people, full of other person's centeredness, full of service to bring glory to Jesus. It would be a beautiful picture of a harmonious church. But again, in reality, churches are often full of people who feel smug or proud about the gift they have been given or feel unimportant or unloved about the gift they haven't been given. And sadly, the gifts that God gave to to build up his church and bring glory to Jesus have been misused and abused. And rather than building people up, they tear people down, they damage people, they cause division, and they malign the name of Jesus Christ. So my goal today is quite simple to help you to be grateful for the gift that God has given you, to be prayerful and expectant for the gifts the Spirit might choose to give you, and to help you to use your gifts wisely and joyfully and sacrificially for the good of others and for the glory of Jesus. I want to start just by clarifying a couple of quick things. Every believer has all of the Holy Spirit. Remember that from last week? Every believer has all of the Holy Spirit. Uh, So 1 Corinthians 12, verse 3, no one can say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. So if you're saying Jesus is your Lord and Savior, you do have all of the Spirit in you. You may not have one of the miraculous gifts of spirits or, or tongues or healings, but you do have a gift and you have the Spirit of God in you. And secondly, I believe that all the gifts of the Spirit exist today. All the gifts of the Spirit exist today. I'm not a cessationalist. So cessationists believe that the, 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 the gifts, the miraculous gifts of the Spirit, ceased with the early church, the death of the apostle, the close of the canon. For, for cessationists, the issue is the sufficiency of Scripture. Uh, so they say that any of the revelatory gifts like prophecies or a, a tongue with interpretation, it undermines the authority of Scripture. I want to say, why? I believe that all Scripture is sufficient for life and godliness and doctrine, but a prophecy or a word weighed against Scripture can still be edifying. So I'm not a cessationalist, and, and I'm not a pseudo-cessationalist who say that there's a possibility of those gifts existing today, 
but there's no expectation and no opportunities. You ask them, does God do miracles? They say, yeah, God does miracles. And they often say about the new birth, but they have no expectation that God will do miracles today. The other end of the spectrum, I'm not a Pentecostal. So Pentecostals believe that all the gifts exist today, but then they elevate certain gifts, like the gift of tongues as a sign you've been baptised with the Spirit, and that becomes the super spiritual gift, and I think that's wrong. So I define myself as a continuationist, believing that all the gifts have continued today. There's opportunity, there's expectation, there's possibilities for any gift or every gift in any kind of gathering. Have I landed that position? It's been a long journey, but I'm persuaded from the Bible itself. And the Bible does say, eagerly desire these gifts. And the Bible commands us to, to use these gifts. The prophecies and tongues and administration and helps, they're all in existence today. And my Bible tells me that these gifts cease not with the death of the apostles, but with the return of Jesus Christ. So the last day when Christ returns, we won't need the gifts of the Spirit because we'll see him face to face. That is 1 Corinthians chapter 13. I find it amazing how many people haven't actually studied the Scriptures on this topic. They've got opinions, often from other people, or they read the Bible through their experience, or often lack of experience, because they haven't experienced something, they say it can't exist. So I'm persuaded by the Bible, I'm persuaded by church history. So from the 2nd to the 4th century, most people believed in the gifts of the Spirit, Justin Martyr, Irenaeus, Tertullian, they spoke about prophecies, healings and tongues. Augustine in the 4th century spoke about miracles. But it's seen in the 4th century, and again at the Reformation, that these gifts were rejected by the church. But as John Wesley said in 1750, the main reason the miraculous gifts were soon withdrawn was because dry, formal, orthodox men began to ridicule whatever gifts they hadn't got themselves and describe them all as evil madness. Yet God used these, so many of these gifts so wonderfully at revivals through Wesley, through Whitfield, and even through Billy Graham. So are these gifts open to abuse? Of course they are. But just because some people have abused them doesn't warrant throwing them all away. And please remember there's abuse on both ends of the spectrum. Pentecostals might abuse them by elevating tongues above all other gifts, but fundamentalists abuse them by ridiculing anybody who has a gift and overlooking drunkenness and adultery and greed. So today I unpack three statements and then paint a picture of what our church could look like if all these gifts are being exercised joyfully and wisely. So number one, every believer has a gift of the Spirit. Every believer has a gift of the Spirit. 1 Corinthians 12, verse 4. There are different kind of gifts, but the same Spirit distributes them. So the word for gift there is the word charismata or charis. It means grace. So these gifts are grace gifts. They are given by the Spirit. They're not earned. It's not a sign of your worthiness. They've just been given to you. It's a gift. And if it's a gift, you can ask for a gift but you may or may not get it. God decides. We're told they're different gifts, so they're not all so-called extraordinary gifts. And even what we call the ordinary gifts of administration or teaching or help, they are actually extraordinary because they're given by God as a gift. And every believer has one. Verse 7 of 1 Corinthians, Now to each one, to each one, the manifestation of the Spirit is given. So God gives each person a spiritual gift. It's different to a natural talent. I mean, music might be a natural talent given to believers and unbelievers. It's a common grace gift. But when you become a Christian, the Spirit of God dwells in you. You might use that gift for the glory of Jesus. It becomes a spiritual gift. You don't earn any gift. You just receive a gift with gratitude and you use it with joy. And it's the same with the gift of the Spirit. So Friends, please be content. Please be grateful for whatever gift God has given you and use it joyfully for the good of others. How do you, how do you discern what your gifts might be? It's really hard, you know, but often you need to ask other people. In your connect group this week, why don't you ask people, 
what do you think of the gifts that the Spirit has given me? They will tell you. And often you need to just try it out. Give it a go. You'll soon find out whether you have a gift or not. And friends, yes, if you really want a particular gift, it's okay to ask. Eagerly desire it. And if it's the Spirit's will, he will give it to you. If it's not his will, he won't give it to you, and that's okay. Just don't envy or covet another person's gift. That is called sin. Be content, be grateful, be joyful for whatever gift God has given you. How do you know these gifts are from the Spirit? Well, look at the way the Spirit works. The Spirit's job is to magnify Jesus, to glorify Jesus, to point people to Jesus. That's how you know whether your gift is from the Spirit. Does it point people to Jesus? It's not about you, it's about Jesus. And please be careful about the way that you speak. We often say this is my gift. My gift is teaching or my gift is hospitality. It's not your gift. It's the Spirit's gift that he's generously given to you. So just use it for his glory. So number one, every believer has a gift. Number two, not every believer has all the gifts. Not every believer has all the gifts of the Spirit. So the gifts of the Spirit is different to the fruit of the Spirit in Galatians chapter 5. The fruit is all about your spiritual character, who you are in Christ. The gifts are about your spiritual capabilities, what you do for Christ. The fruit develops gradually over time. So over time you develop patience, you develop kindness. You're always working on that. But the the gifts are are, are given spontaneously and suddenly. So we won't all prophesy, we won't all speak in tongues. So every believer is expected to exhibit all the fruit of the Spirit, but every believer will not have all the gifts of the Spirit. Uh, Those gifts appear in four passages of Scripture. Romans 12, 1 Corinthians 12, Ephesians 4, and 1 Peter 4. There's about 20 gifts that are listed from wisdom to knowledge to tongues to healings to administration to hospitality, but it's not an exhaustive list. And the point is that every believer has a different gift and we all need each other to use our gifts well. The language of the scripture is that we are a body. That's 1 Corinthians 12, 12 onwards. The, The church is a body with many parts, verse 12. But all its many parts form one body. And what he's saying there is that just as, as a physical body needs each part of the body to, to play its part. So if the kidney suddenly decides it doesn't want to be a kidney, it wants to be a liver and stops working, you're in trouble. Or if a foot decides it's fed of being covered and wants to be an eyeball, you're in trouble. So you've got a gift and I've got a gift and we need each other to actually celebrate our gifts and use them for the good of the other person. So even if you see yourself as the most feeble, least needed part of this church family, if you don't exercise a gift that God has given you, this church will not function well. And no, fun- no church can function well if just one or two people think they can do everything because they can't. I'm so thankful for this church where people use all their gifts, like the gift of helps, where people turn up and they set up and they pack up and they serve behind the scenes, or the gift of administration with the rosters or the the governance or the finance committee, or, or for the gift of teaching or for the gift of prophecy. We're all different, and not every believer has the same gifts. So every believer has a gift, not every believer has all the gifts. Number three, the gifts are to be used for edification and evangelism. We're to use our gifts to build people up in Christ and to point people to Christ. And again, isn't that the work of the Holy Spirit? To always point people to Christ. So these gifts of the Spirit must be used in a way to shine Jesus. Do you get it? Church is not about you. You are not the most important person in church. Jesus is. And the Spirit's given you gifts, so use them. Use them to build other people up, not to puff yourself up. Use them to bring glory to Jesus, not glory to you. Listen to 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 10. Each of you should use whatever gift you have received to serve others as faithful stewards of God's grace in its various forms. We're stewards of grace to build God's kingdom. Verse 11, if anyone speaks, 
they should do so as one who speaks the word of God. If anyone serves, they should do so with the strength that God provides, so that in all things God may be praised through Jesus Christ. To him, to Jesus, be glory and power forever and ever. So that's the goal, building people up in Christ. Friends, you do not spend time, all this time, longing for a gift or navel-gazing at a gift you've been given. Just use it joyfully and sacrificially to build other people up in Christ. I love Romans 12. He says this, If your gift is teaching, then teach. If prophecy, then prophesy. Just use your gift. Because 2 Corinthians 5 verse 10 says, we'll stand before the judgment seat of God and explain how we've used our gifts. So use them for the common good. That's the word used in 1 Corinthians 12 verse 7. For the common good. Not to make you look good or you feel good or for you to have some amazing, proud, spiritual, high experience but for the common good to build other people up. I love 1 Corinthians 4 verse 12. Since you're eager for gifts of the Spirit, try to excel in the gifts that build up God's church. So a good way of discerning whether you've got a gift is to ask, are people being edified through it? I sat under a pastor who thought he had the gift of teaching, but he didn't. And so he went to Bible college and he had his head full of knowledge. I think he had the gift of knowledge, but not the gift of teaching. So week in, week out, we were not edified because we could understand what he was saying. I've sat in churches where people have got the gift of tongues, but they choose to exercise that gift for themselves, not for others, because no one can understand what they're saying. So believers are edified and unbelievers are evangelized. In 1 Corinthians 14, verses 20 to 25, let me paraphrase it. Someone walks into a church on a Sunday and people are prophesying, they are speaking about Jesus in an intelligible, clear, orderly way. And that person says, wow, surely God is here among you. Do you get it? You're given gifts to use to build other people up and to point people to Jesus. In 1 Corinthians 14, as we had read to us, it describes this gathering where everybody has someone to contribute, a word, a hymn, a tongue, but it's all done in an orderly way, an intelligible way. Uh, 14 verse 40 says, everything should be done in a fitting and orderly way because God is a God of order, not disorder and chaos. And that was a problem in Corinth because they were using their gifts to be divisive and disorderly. So when we use our gifts, it's intelligible, so it's understandable. Paul does not forbid speaking in tongues. He makes that very clear in 1 Corinthians 14. He himself speaks in tongues more than all people, chapter 4, verse 18. But, verse 19, but in a church he would rather have five intelligible words to instruct others than 10,000 words in the tongue. So he'd rather stand up and say, Jesus Christ died for you, than to have 20 minutes of unintelligible tongue speaking. It is intelligible, it is orderly. We saw that in 14 verse 27. If you've got tongues in a gathering, two or three at most, one at a time, so it's orderly. Same with prophecy. If you've got prophecy in a gathering, verse 29, two or three people speak, one at a time, weighed against Scripture, It is so orderly, but there is spontaneity. I love this. You expect people to stand up in church and to use their gifts, to play their part. There's spontaneity in our gatherings because the Spirit of God might choose to use his gifts at that moment. And this is what I've been pondering this week. Are are, our gatherings too structured, too regulated? One person said this, rather than unstructured spontaneity that creates bedlam. We're confronted with well-regulated order of worship that creates boredom. So we print a program of everything that is going to happen during the hour and the sequence in which it will take place. And once it's been printed, it becomes a sacred thing to those who planned it. And the likelihood of the spirits leading anyone to say or do something that was not anticipated on Tuesday when the order was planned is very, very remote. 
And that's what we have open mic in church. A moment in church where anybody can stand up and use their gifts. That's why we changed the name from open encouragement to open mic, to, to give you the, the potential to use all the gifts of the Spirit, a word of prophecy, a word of knowledge, a tongue with interpretation. So believers are edified and unbelievers are evangelised. It is one of my favourite parts of the gathering. So, so every believer has a gift, not every believer has all the gifts, and the gifts are used for edification and evangelism. But I want to finish today by imagining what our church would look like if every believer used their gifts to build other people up. I want to read through this list in 1 Corinthians 12, and it's not exhaustive, but just picture what church could look like. 12 verse 8. To one that's given through the Spirit a message of wisdom. So people have this gift of bringing this helpful insight, wise, godly counsel to, for decision making. And we need you in church to stand up and to share that gift, to get alongside the person in church who is making foolish and worldly decisions and to sit over coffee and to exercise your gift of wisdom. Uh, to another verse, eight, a message of knowledge by the same Spirit, that ability to understand profound truths of God. So the person in your connect group who, you know when that person speaks and they they tie in all these scriptures and it just brings clarity. They may not be the leader of the group, but they have this gift of knowledge. The Bible college lecturer who's equipping the next generation of pastors or the person who's lovingly ensuring the word of God is handled correctly in our sermons. To another, verse 9, the gift of faith. What a great gift that is, the gift of faith. He's not talking about saving faith. We all have saving faith. But some people, the Spirit has gifted with this incredible, extraordinary trust in God's goodness and trust in God's sovereignty and trust in God's provision in, in the most difficult of situations. And I think of William Carey in India or Hudson Taylor in China or Corrie Ten Boom in the concentration camps or George Muller who lived by faith daily praying for daily provisions. And we have people in our church with that gift. And when you stand up and talk about God's goodness and sovereignty and provisions and how you live by faith, we are built up. To another verse 9, the gift of healing by that one spirit. We need that gift today, the gift of cures. People still get sick and our God is still compassionate and our God still heals. And yes, we need doctors. Of course we need doctors. They're a gift from God. But God can and does heal miraculously today. Some people have this gift where they can pray over somebody and plead with God for somebody, maybe lay hands or anoint them with oil and God brings healing. I've been in a healing service in this church where somebody prayed over somebody in tongues and asked for healing and this particular sick, per sick person was healed in the most amazing way actually. Uh, God provided actually a, a doctor who he'd never heard of who performed a surgery that was unheard of and he was completely healed. Uh, other ways we, we pray for people with cancer and they've gone for their checkups and the cancer has miraculously gone and the doctors are stunned. I've seen physical healing, emotional healing, psychological healing we need that gift in our church today. Yes, it can be abused. Terrible abuse when people say you're not healed because you don't have enough faith. That is always wrong. But just because it's abused doesn't mean we throw it out. To another verse 10, the gift of miraculous powers. That is God's mighty wonders beyond known physical law. So you, in the Bible you see miracles. The Red Sea is divided. Elijah on Mount Carmel. Jesus as he walked on earth. And I believe miracles can still exist today. Interestingly, I've been pondering why these miracles seem to happen in other cultures but not our own. To another verse 10. This is a good one. The gift of prophecy. It's hard to define. It's mentioned in lots of bits of scripture. 1 Thessalonians 5, Romans 12, Ephesians 4, Acts 11, 13, 15, 19, and 1 Corinthians 12 to 14. So here's my definition. Prophecy is speaking a word from God with powerful directness and unmistakable relevance 
to build up an individual or a group of people in church. Let me be very clear, it's, it's not the same as Old Testament capital P prophet who spoke the infallible word of God. But prophecy, according to 14 verse 3, says, the one who prophesies speaks to people for their strengthening, their encouraging, and their comfort. So the word given by God to strengthen, to encourage, and to comfort God's people. And we need discernment with prophecy. Not every prophecy is true, so test it, 1 Thessalonians. Weigh it, 1 Corinthians. Discern what's in line with Scripture, and then take it and use it. So here in our church, I'd love to see the gift of prophecy. Now, on a Sunday, you might be sitting here feeling compelled by, by the Spirit of God to stand up and speak a word, a word of knowledge, a word of encouragement, a word of, of confrontation, perhaps, that's going to speak to people directly in that moment. You might read something in your Bible on a Wednesday that you are convicted by or challenged by, and as you're sitting in church thinking, I must get up and share that because there are other people who need to hear that word. In a conversation over supper, people might say, wow, that's just what I needed to hear at this moment. That's a prophetic word. Preaching can be prophecy. Praying can be prophecy. As you're prompted to send a text, as I was this week, a text to somebody who I hadn't seen for a long time with a word for them, it was just what they needed at that moment. I know many people in our church have this gift of prophecy, so please use it. Verse 10 again, distinguishing between spirits, that ability to discern what's true, what is false, that ability to perceive hypocrisy or shallowness or phoniness. You need that gift. Or verse 10, different kinds of tongues or languages. This is a very easy to define. There are two types of tongues in Scripture. The known languages of Acts chapter 2 where the disciples were given the gift of languages they hadn't learned so the gospel could go out at Pentecost. And that happens today. People suddenly end up speaking Russian. They never learned it. But, but the, the, the tongues in 1 Corinthians is the unknown language, the unintelligible utterances, a non-human language. According to 14 verse 2, anyone who speaks in a tongue doesn't speak to people but to God. Indeed, no one understands them. They utter mysteries by the Spirit. So this gift is used for your personal edification like a personal prayer language to build up your relationship with God. It's a great gift. It builds you up. It's not the greatest gift. It's not the, the super spiritual gift. It's not a second blessing gift. If you've got the gift of tongues, use it. Enjoy those beautiful, intimate, personal, devotional times with God. I rarely talk about it. There's no need to talk about it, but I've got the gift of tongues. And I love using it in my personal prayer times. But without interpretation, it will be unintelligible in church. And I find it so sad this gift has been divisive and church have obsessed over it. Let's just use it for the glory of God. There's interpretation of tongues in verse 10. In verse 28, you've got the gift of helping. That's a wonderful gift of supporting and assisting and serving. Verse 28, the gift of guidance or administration, like directing and governing. And, and we need those people in church. Romans 12, you've got gifts of teaching, encouraging, leadership, mercy. 1 Peter 4, you've got the gift of hospitality where you have the gift of inviting a stranger into your home or sharing a meal. Ephesians 4, you've got the gift of the evangelist, people who can speak boldly and people are converted. Or the gift of pastor teachers who shepherd the flock through the teaching of God's word. My point is this, there's, a, there's, a, there's many, many gifts and the church needs all of them. Can you imagine a church where we're all contributing and all using our gifts joyfully and willingly and selflessly to serve other people and no one's smug because they've got this gift and no one is self-pitying because they haven't got the gift and no one's saying, I want that and I want that. But instead we're thinking of other people and we're thinking, how can I use what God has given me today to bring glory to God? That would be a wonderful church, wouldn't it? Now, I long for this church to, yes, be committed to, to strong biblical teaching, but also to create space, space on a Sunday and throughout the week for people to exercise the gifts of the Spirit that God has given them. So seek the gifts, use the gifts, 
in love and thank God for whatever gift he has given you. Can you imagine a church where every day is like Christmas Day, full of gratitude, full of joy, and full of other person-centeredness? What a blessing that would be. So let me pray. Thank you, Father, for the gifts you've given us. And we pray we might use them joyfully and wisely for the building up of your church. Please use us to bring people to Christ. Help us, Lord, to be sacrificial and selfless and to be wise. We thank you, Father, that you keep on filling your church and equipping your church with these different gifts. In Jesus' name, amen. Should nothing of our efforts stand, no legacy survive, unless the Lord does raise the house in vain, its builders strive to to cry.
sing all glory be to Christ in the darkness we were waiting without hope and without light till from heaven you came on there was mercy in your eyes to fulfill the law and prophets to a virgin came the one from his throne of endless glory to a cradle in the dust you. Jesus, our Saviour, we praise You. Holy Spirit, we praise You. Thank You for this time this morning and tonight that we've had to worship You, to sit under Your Word, to learn about You, Holy Spirit. Thank You for the gifts of the Spirit. Thank You, Lord, that You have not left us here on earth without 
your power and your strength. You have filled us and you continue to fill us with your strength and power of the Holy Spirit. Praise you, God. Go with us this week and fill us again. In Jesus' Name, Amen. And as we finish today, I want to leave you with a scripture. It's from Isaiah 60. And I believe that actually the Lord is saying this over His church, His bride. Jesus is saying this over His bride right now, despite the season that we're all actually living through. The verse is Isaiah 60, 1 to 3. The Lord says, Arise, shine, for your light has come and the glory of the Lord rises upon you. See, darkness covers the earth and thick darkness is over the peoples, but the Lord rises upon you and His glory appears over you. Nations will come to your light and kings to the brightness of your dawn. And this is the word of our Lord. And it is true and it is a promise even for this season and this time. So may you go out filled with the glory of God, the Holy Spirit in His strength and power this week, knowing that you serve and love a victorious God and that it is time to arise and to shine for your light has come. Thanks for joining us for Church Online. If you're new with us, we are so glad that you joined us today. We'd love you to fill in the connection card where we can help you get further connected into church. For all of us, there's the Enjoying God podcast, which launches tomorrow. A couple of us congregational pastors got together and had a relaxed, fun conversation about what does it mean to enjoy God when you do, when you don't, when it's different to those around you. And so it's going to be a couple of episodes. First one kicks off tomorrow. You can go to Spotify or iTunes and type in Enjoying God podcast and have a listen. Well, brothers and sisters, let me end by praying for us. Father, Take us and use us to love and serve you and indeed all people in the power of your spirit and in the name of your son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Well, may the God of hope fill you with joy and peace so that as you trust him, you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen.